is uh, Mind Your Career webinar. My name is Sam Constance, and I work with the Alumni Career Development Team here at the University of Chicago. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm delighted to welcome you to our webinar entitled Leading Your Job Search Through a Career Change. I'll start by introducing our two alumna presenters. The first is Linda Levinson Harvey. Linda is an experienced career strategist, talent developer, and coach with more than 25 years of experience working with clients seeking to advance their personal and professional lives. Her practice includes career advisory and job search strategies for recent graduates, as well as workforce reentry for women and for seasoned professionals seeking promotion. Linda has global experience working in career management and admissions with top tier MBA programs such as Chicago Booth, Northwestern Kellogg School of Management, and the London Business School. She was the inaugural staff director for the LEAD program at Chicago Booth, and additionally served the school by leading the leadership portfolio of programs as a member of the executive education team. Linda has corporate consulting experience, providing thought leadership to senior executives in people strategy, hiring, and learning and development. Linda's active in workforce development, job readiness training, and first-gen college programs in her community. In addition to her Chicago Booth MBA, she's an alumna of the University of Chicago's graduate program in health administration um, and policy and holds a Bachelor of Science in Psychology from Grinnell College. Our second presenter today is Anne-Marie Segal. As an executive coach, Anne-Marie partners with senior and emerging leaders to facilitate career transitions, leadership development, job interview preparation, resume writing, and personal branding. Prior to coaching, Anne-Marie served as an attorney for 15 years, including at the international law firm White & Case and a multi-strategy private equity and hedge fund manager, excuse me. Holding a JD from New York University School of Law and an AM in art history from the University of Chicago and a BA in fine arts from Loyal and University of Chicago, Anne-Marie is a certified career management coach, online profile expert and professional resume writer. Without further ado, it's my pleasure to cede the floor to Linda and Anne-Marie. Thank you both. Thank you, Sam. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Unfortunately, my camera, for whatever reason today, is not operating, so it's Linda speaking. And um, Anne Marie, are you also unmuted and available? I don't know if they can see you, but hopefully Here they can. Am. There she is. Excellent. Good afternoon and welcome. So, in addition to um, the bios that Sam shared with you about both myself and Anne Marie, we thought that because the topic today is on career change, it was important to let you know a little bit about some of the pivots that we have made within our own careers. And so, as noted, my early career was in human resources within the healthcare setting. And then post MBA, I transitioned into management consulting, retaining the healthcare setting. And then I pivoted toward higher education. And for me, the free thread throughout all of those transitions at the start of my career was focused on what do people do in the world of work? And that is what has sustained me and brought me to this point of sharing what I know with you in this webinar. And Marie, do you wanna talk a little bit about some of the transitions you've had? Sure. So I, if you saw my bio, my master's degree from the University of Chicago is in art history. I pivoted to law. I was in law for 15 years in different roles. Um, five years ago, almost to the day, actually tomorrow will be five years um, since I launched my coaching practice. Like you who are celebrating birthdays, it's a little um, anticlimactic at the moment, but um, I'll tell you more about the change, the skills that I took from art history, funny enough, now are very applicable to when I work with people on presentations, for example, visual, nothing is ever lost. So I was in four different settings as an attorney, got a lot of feedback and considered the way my network was set up, decided to work with attorneys and executives in the coaching space. Um, and Linda will be talking about this more, but thinking about what's my market, what are my transferable skills, the same way we'll be teaching you today. Excellent. So as noted, we're ready for the next slide. Um, we wanted to make sure that even though we started planning for this webinar in January and the world as we knew it in January has changed significantly, we're joined today by the pachyderm in the room, um, this friendly elephant known as COVID-19 and the coronavirus climate. And where possible, Emory and I have talked at length about what is 
the same and what may very well be different given the new normal that the world finds itself in. And so what we wanted to make sure to acknowledge is that the world has significantly changed. Um, for many, um, working from home and adjusting to the realities of being uh, away from their world of work, from their office mates and that level of uh, daily interaction is an adjustment. Additional responsibilities uh, are training individuals' time, whether they're having to uh, do homeschooling, having to adjust to that work from home environment, or they've added additional caretaking responsibilities. Um, while at some points throughout this process, you may feel like you've got all the time in the world and why wouldn't somebody want to talk to you um, or engage you in what's top of mind about your career search and your path and uh, uh, pursuit of information. Having a level of understanding about how this disruption is affecting others uh, uh, and being able to just adapt yourself in different ways when you seek additional information from others is important. Um, additionally, um, the ability to use technology and to deploy technology in service of your pursuit of information is something that's vitally important. And my camera not functioning today, notwithstanding, we're not sure what the issue of it is. Um, when we tested the webinar a week ago, I was there ready to go. So I, again, apologize for your not being able to see me, but you can certainly hear me and know that I'm fully present in uh, the way that I can be for the time we have together today. Um, Anne Marie, you noted some uh, current events overnight that I would uh, encourage you to share with the group. Right, and when we tested this, the heater was working in my home. <laughs> As I told you um, and, and Sam before, I, I'm kind of business casual today. My suit wasn't even enough to keep me warm in the house today. Um, so we're all going through changes. Um, the the article that I wanted to share with all of you was a Challenger Gray survey. Um, they're a well-known firm and they've surveyed the marketplace, um, different levels of employers, different sizes. And, and so Sam will send out over the article in just a moment. It's on CNBC. Coronavirus job survey, 49% of companies considering layoffs, more than one third freezing new hires. I've had clients asking me, what, what's my view on the market? So I would say this is probably in some ways about a good a read, as good of a read as any that we'll be getting. It may be different, of course, for University of Chicago grads than the workforce in general, the numbers, but the idea behind it that many employers are tightening their belts. If you if you've um, been subject to, um, even before the lockdowns, not being able to fly um, and, and that sort of thing, obviously we'll be seeing that continue. I'm not trying to have a crystal ball here, but one thing we wanted to make sure everybody took away from this webinar is we're thinking about the short term and we're thinking about the long term and we're thinking about what you can change in your career, how you can envision a career change whether you're with the same employer or you're moving. And we'll talk about that more in the webinar. So Sam, maybe you could send around that link, not that I encourage everyone to suddenly start reading that right away, but so that they have it for future reference. Terrific, thanks Anne-Marie. So what follows is what Anne-Marie and I have prepared and where appropriate if there is a COVID-19 climate connection that we've already discussed or that we think is important to share with you, we will. Uh, our purpose today is I will take you through the first half of this agenda of knowing and leading yourself through a career change and then uh, share with uh, Anne-Marie the, the leadership of the webinar and she will talk about optimizing your job search and personal branding. Um, before we get completely started into the body of our webinar, we do have those polls that Sam uh, mentioned, so we're ready to turn it back to Sam to get a sense of who's joining us on the webinar and get a little bit of information from you all. Sam, take it away. Thank you both. So here is our first poll, if you wouldn't mind taking a second to respond so that we can get a sense of um, where you are in your job search. And then once you have answered the poll, I want to direct your attention to the handout section of the GoToWebinar platform. You'll find the PowerPoint from today's presentation, as well as a list of suggested resources from, from Linda and Anne-Marie, and we'll be sending these in an email as well following this presentation along with a recording of the webinar. 
All right, it looks like about 80% uh, or so of our attendees have, have voted. So I will go ahead and share the results. So here we are. As you can see, it looks like 44%, the highest percentage are actively looking. We've got 20% 20, 20 of attendees starting their search, 18 considering a change, 16% just keeping my eyes open, and then um, coming in at the end is 2% with other. Mm -hmm. and we'll jump into our second poll as well here. We want to get a sense of what best describes the career change that you seek. And Again, Sam, please well, take a second to respond. While people are completing this poll, um, could we have them type some information about themselves into the chat box or question box? Yes, yeah, I would love that. So once you've answered this poll, please take a second to share in the questions section of the GoToWebinar platform where you're tuning in from today and then what level you're at in your career. We'd love to hear if you're early career, mid career, or experienced. And that, of course, will help us really direct the webinar to the audience that we have. I see we've got over 70 people here at the moment, um, obviously more signing on after, or sorry, listening to the replay after. And it looks like we've got people tuning in from all over the place. We've got um, Oakland, California, Toronto, England, um, Brooklyn, Chicago. Um, DC. So we've got people from all over the world tuning in and, and it looks like we've got a fair mix too of, um, of experience levels. A, a good number of people here are, are listing themselves as um, mid-career and experienced, although there are, are some um, entry-level folks tuning in as well. Okay. Um, and it looks like we've got a good percentage of our poll um, taken, so I'm going to close that and share the results with you here. So 36 percent um, are, are looking to pivot entirely to a new career and then tied at 26 percent they're looking for a change of employer or a move to related fields eight percent of our attendees are looking for career advancement and then others is our last three percent so take it away emily and linda thanks so much that was worthwhile data we're ready for the next slide um, just note that at the end of the presentation we will have a moderated question and answer segment that sam will help us with moderating so Knowing that um, the vast majority of you are in an active search mode, a reasonable place to start is with a period of self-reflection and self-awareness, where you're able to discover both your strengths and your interests. And a reasonable, again, starting point for all of that is to uncover what are your transferable skills. What are the things that you have employed and developed as an area of expertise that you can retain into a new opportunity. And those transferable skills may have a functional component to them. They may have a focus on a particular industry. They may be related to how you navigate relationships within the function or role that you have had. They may be more uh, strategic in their orientation in terms of your industry or knowledge of a different area. And gaining that understanding of who you are what you're good at and what you love to do is an important component in order to truly understand what you bring to a new opportunity and how can you strategically uh, position yourself and articulate your value proposition to a, toward a new opportunity. In identifying transferable skills, Anne Marie on her website, in which the links will be provided after the webinar, has a series of exercises and worksheets that will help guide you in understanding what might be your unique transferable skills to a new opportunity. Um, to give you a sense of the context of what might be a set of transferable skills, um, I had a recent experience working with a software engineer who aspired to become a product manager. They were working for a global technology professional services firm. And in our conversations, this individual contributor talked about what they hoped to be able to accomplish as a, pro as a product manager, um, but was very aspirational without having had the time to explore more specifically and concretely, what do they bring to that new role? So in our work together, we worked at uncovering that this person as a software engineer had robust analytical and quantitative reasoning skills. They had 
on a comfort level and a facility with uh, allocating time and resources on constraint to a new area. And so we worked on how they would articulate those two pieces of their strengths and transferable skills when looking to deploy in a new role as a product manager. Happy to report that after a period of informational interviews within that organization, that person was successful in making a transition to the role of a product manager within that same global technology professional services firm. So I think that it's important to realize that there are opportunities to articulate what you bring as a transferable skill set to new roles, while many of you noted that you want to pivot completely out of your current employment situation. And given the circumstances that we find ourselves in in a COVID-19 climate, uh, you may be compelled to make those transitions sooner than expected. The period of self-discovery and reflection that you go through and the exercises to truly get close to what are you good at and what do you want to continue to do in service of another is time well spent. It gives you both the data that you can bring to a new opportunity and gives you the opportunity also to articulate them in a persuasive way. And the next Sorry. area, and the next area where we talk about domain, no, no, we're still on the same slide. <laughs> I to talk about, that's okay. Um, talking about domains, industry, and content that are meaningful to you as you think about what it is that you love to do. A domain can be basically the knowledge of what you do, um, whether it's specific knowledge and conveys a specific set of expertise and skills within a functional area, or more generalized knowledge. Um, it's important to get a sense of what do you do. Um, it's important also to understand different industries and to figure out what fields or areas you may be able to deploy what it is that you know. In my own uh, career transitions, as noted at the top of the webinar, when I transitioned away from healthcare and toward higher education, for me, the through thread was everything that I had done within the healthcare setting was focused on what do people do in the world of work and what are the skills that they bring to the interpersonal relationships, the team dynamics, their approach to managing themselves and leading themselves and navigating the world of work with other people. I retained that in all of the opportunities and experiences that I pursued within higher education and now into my role as a career coach as well. Um, additionally, content is uh, basically what you do and how you do it. And so getting close to understanding what about the domains, the industry, and the content that you do, you'd like to retain. In typical University of Chicago fashion, um, a former head of the psych department at the University of Chicago, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, uh, popularized the concept of flow that many of you may be already familiar with. Flow being a heightened state of mental acuity and engagement that allows you to be most productive and most thoroughly engaged in the work that you do. Being able to find your flow, articulate your flow, pursue opportunities where you can be in flow as it relates to your primary occupation are absolutely important. Um, so that's part of the exploration of connecting better with your strengths and your interests. Um, note also that flow need not be a singular thing. It may not be only doing um, uh, spreadsheets or something simple and narrow in scope. It can be a suite of activities, a suite of uh, engagements that allow you to feel most productive and most meaningful as it relates to your world of work. Again, a personal example. So for me, um, this is new, so I appreciate you all being on the call. Conducting a webinar is not something that I have done extensively in the past. And so um, that's something that's outside of my comfort zone. Maybe I'll find that it becomes or forms a part of my flow. But for me, what I have identified as an aspect of flow, something that I love to do, is the one-on-one -on -one coaching that I do. When I'm able to engage with an individual and dialogue back and forth to uncover and discover something new and find the words by which to express what it is that we've discovered about them and their values and to move that into a, a, a new area to help them advance in their careers, to make a change, to get closer to being um, the fuller best version of themselves 
that's where Linda Harvey finds her flow. So I wanted to share that on a personal dimension because I think that that's important that finding your flow is um, the sum total of the activities that you engage in. Now we're ready for the next slide, Emily. Thank yep. you. And um, you have his book um, in the in the list, right? I do, I do. So it talks about the uh, ways in which you can find meaning as it relates to your world of work, and that's from Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, former head of the psych department at the University of Chicago, uh, who popularized those ideas. So once you've had a period of exploration where you're getting close to what it is that you are good at as a strength, the things that you want to do um, because they are of interest to you, then it's also important to figure out is there a market for what you're good at and what you love to do. And part of that is identification or market identification is accessing information, doing some research, um, connecting with others who are in professions or industries or fields that are of interest to you, uh, seeking out informational interviews um, and developing a point of view. There's a lot of information that's available to you free. Um, there's a lot of information that will require you to ask someone for information and insight. And um, so again, in this post-COVID environment, you're going to want to be mindful that some individuals will be more than happy to talk to you about what it is that they do and share with you their lessons learned and their points of view on that field or that industry or that function or the future. Um, but put on all of your thinking caps and assess for yourselves too, is that an area that you're interested in pursuing further and what's your sense of what that um, opportunity may involve and may, may require of you. Um, Sometimes the timeline, again, in this post-COVID environment, as noted by what Emily sent around from CNBC overnight in terms of uh, the uncertainty and the insecurity of the future with furloughs and layoffs happening, um, your ability and access to information may be um, at your fingertips, but still no clearer in terms of giving you an answer. So a lot of this exploration in this process is going to be very much what are you willing to try and how are you willing to try it. Um, you may un uncover that there are opportunities for you to upskill or reskill yourself in service of a newer role or making that career pivot. Um, if there is a down period in the work that you're doing and there are resources that are available to you from the learning and development uh, side of your organizations, don't discount them even if you are considering leaving that organization in the future or being forced away. Um, those are very robust resources that are available to you. So don't be shy about accessing them while you still can. Uh, LinkedIn is also a very rich resource in terms of both networking, connecting with individuals, but also there's a full range of forums and discussion groups where individuals are sharing their points of view, their expertise, joining some of those, of those forums will require you to uh, go to a moderator or administrator and ask for entry into that private group. Um, but it's a way for you to learn additional, additionally what, what's going on. What's that field like? What are people thinking about? What are they tracking? What is the thought leadership happening in those areas? Um, and that's important for you to pursue um, to get a sense of what's happening. Additionally, when um, Look, LinkedIn is a reasonable resource to look for job postings and understanding what's required of a particular role or function, uh, as are the uh, company websites um, to understand what's there. And when you look at a job posting, bear in mind, what is it that you bring with you already from the experiences that you've had to date and the skills and talents that you've already acquired and what gaps may exist and whether you pursue uh, addressing those gaps via additional education or additional certifications, that's up to you. That may be required, that may not be required. There's also the very real possibility in this era, post-COVID era, where there will be opportunities for you to take action in sectors or areas different than what you've done before as your primary occupation, where you can volunteer um, and acquire additional skills in that act of volunteering or adding value in a different way. Um, I have had clients in the past where they were um, a junior level uh, individuals immediately post undergraduate working as um, accounting analysts. 
at a junior level and they aspired to be in something more meaningful than doing accounting for major corporations. And they were able to pick up volunteer work where they would deploy their expertise and in accounting, but in a nonprofit setting. So they were able to actually get into another environment that would inform them about how does that particular environment work and is it really a driver of my flow, a driver of my satisfaction to be deploying what I know how to do, but in a different setting. So those are all things to consider when identifying your goals as making a career change um, and how do you um, pursue that. Uh, information overload is everywhere. Um, we'd be remiss if we didn't at least mention it. Um, and I would say that the, the, what I advise most of my clients to do is that you can have sources of information with a wide range of opinions. And at the end of the day, you're the final arbiter of what is a fit for you. And um, you can pursue, pursue, pursue information, information, and get inundated with it. And then unfortunately engage in a level of analysis paralysis where you're continuing to seek out information and opinion, but you're not always integrating it enough yourself so that you can then make choices for what steps you will take and what actions you will take to do differently or to get you to a new opportunity or a new set of circumstances. So uh, the watchword there is to pace yourself every time you take on new information, work to integrate it into what you're accessing and what, what you're developing as your own orientation and point of view to a new opportunity. Let's talk about assessing opportunities. Sure, although Linda, I wanna just yes. comment on something you said, that Please analysis do. paralysis, um, very important point, and I think it's even more relevant now with COVID because we're all kind of in that um, oversensitized state, right? Where we're, we're sometimes afraid to make a move, not knowing what to do next. So mm -hmm. you're right to, to really vet it for yourself, what makes sense based on where you're going, what your goals are. I, I completely agree. Thank you for that. Oh. Got to get myself to the next slide. There we go. Terrific. So interesting to note and not entirely unexpected. When we took the poll at the front end with Sam's help, when we discovered that 44% of you on our webinar today were actively looking and that there were 36% of you that wanted to pivot entirely into a new area. In our parlance, I would call that a big C change, capital C change, where perhaps you're completely changing paths, domain, content setting, or environment. And there is often when entertaining the idea of a career change that it doesn't feel like a career change unless, in, unless you're making capital C changes, completely changing tracks. And I wanted to raise in this webinar the idea that sometimes sustainable change and significant change can happen when you're doing lowercase little c changes minor tweaks or migrations toward new roles that allow you to take a more sequential uh, approach to creating that change um, and Anne marie and i have talked a lot about what are in our client practices examples of big c changes and little c changes and how um, we might approach them so and Lee, i invite you to to share with us a couple of cases about what uh, you've seen in your practice. Sure, absolutely. And sorry, I keep trying to mute it a little bit. They're fixing the heater right under me. <laughs> um, so that's why you, you you see me, I keep trying to move back and forth to mute it on and off. And sorry, the slides are going. Um, so, Linda, you wanna first tell them what this slide is about, this photo that we have up here? Absolutely. So. Um, Emery has discovered in our work together collaborating on this webinar that I love metaphors and working with metaphors I think is a great way to shorthand the process of communicating what it is that they're thinking. So we have used a metaphor of travel and transportation as a metaphor for one, when one changes lanes and makes a career change. And the purpose of this photo is to say that when you're thinking about what it is that you want to do next, Sometimes we can get so uh, focused on the immediate next 
car directly in front of us and it's more clearly in focus that says, okay, I just need to move in this direction, but we lose sight and some of the clarity of the longer view. Right. And so the purpose of this photograph is to show that if you're going to be strategic and take some responsibility and ownership over your own career and lead yourself through any form of transition, you have to be able to do both, to be fully cognizant of what's directly in front of you so you don't get into trouble, but you also want to scan the horizon and scan what's two or three vehicles ahead of you on the road and where you want to go next so that you can actually move yourself in a reasonable manner to the next level. Right, right. And we also said, you know, we're stuck with cars in front of us now, right? In this mm -hmm. kind of environment that we're in. And and we we really want people to be thinking about this. You know, the idea that, oh, well, there's nothing available to me. There's nowhere for me to move. I'm boxed in. Mm -hmm. Feeling that you might have at the moment to also be taking the long-term view. So um, I had two clients in recent months that I could use as examples for you, Linda, and you know, I gave them my own counsel, but mm -hmm. what would you say to each of these as a coach if they had come to you? So the first one, um, he's in finance, he was laid off before COVID, um, and he had said, well, you know, I, I really kind of want to maintain my standard of living. I mentioned before COVID because now people may take a bit of a different analysis sometimes, and again, that's a very individual decision. Um, he said he's interested in teaching, possibly um, marketing was another area, um, also throughout data analytics as something that he might be interested in pursuing, obviously maybe still staying in finance if that's open to him. Um, so if this person had come to you, and so I like the idea of going through the what we've talked about in the prior slides and, and how would that actually be applied in this example? Sure, sure. So one thing that I would look at with this individual is looking at what have they deployed in terms of their skills in the finance function and what do they think readily applies to either teaching or data analytics or marketing and understanding that what they know today as it relates to the occupation that they've held, where they perceive to be their unique talents and strengths and level of expertise, and what would they carry with them into another setting or another profession. Um, as it relates to teaching with this particular um, individual, I would encourage them to really vet do I like the idea of teaching, the level of preparation that's required to uh, prepare uh, a presentation, to communicate effectively what is the same or what is different from what I had to do in my finance role. Um, a lot of it may be, in fact, quite similar. There are research skills and analytical skills and communication skills that are involved in working within that functional area of finance that may readily apply to becoming uh, a teacher of one kind. Teaching is broad based, so getting additional information about what does that profession look like and at what level would they want to deploy. Um, maybe there are opportunities for them to uh, get closer to the pedagogical areas, or maybe there are opportunities for them to teach finance as an adjunct in that they're taking their level of expertise but adding on the new skill set of teaching and exploration. Um, as it relates to maintaining their quality of life, I think that that's a harder um, piece to advise because it is such a uniquely personal uh, trade-off and set of circumstances. But I think as a coach, the biggest piece that I would want to push up, out as information, something for the individual to grasp onto, is that it is their decision ultimately. Um, mm -hmm. That they have to take ownership and responsibility for the trade-offs and the choices that they take on. Um, sometimes circumstances are propelling us and creating circumstances that feel very much out of our control. And so ways to navigate through this process are when you can take back a level of autonomy and a level, a level of agency. Right, right. And of course, that's what I faced when I launched my own law firm. And then later, when I launched my coaching practice, your income is less certain. And it's a question of how you set yourself up, what reserves you have, not just financially, but emotionally, right? Mm -hmm. And what, what are you willing to weather and what risks and rewards are you willing to consider? 
exactly right, exactly right. And then also embedded in that example of your finance person who was entertaining thoughts of other professions. Um, when it comes to things like data analytics, um, those are fuzzy right now. There's a lot of energy around them. Um, right. And so getting a realistic view of what gaps may exist between what they think they know how and what they think they know about a desired or aspirational industry or function um, has to be matched and married and evaluated with data that the and research that they uncover. So that's something that they have to really engage with as well. Right. And you know, my husband's in data analytics, he always says you have to really love it. You know, mm -hmm. it's not something you can just jump into um, because it's in demand. But it, it to to get into it, fine, but to actually be successful you know, and that's the same with anything, you know, whether it's arts based or very technical, right? Yes. Um, and that goes to my second person who is very technical um, and she's looking to move up to a managerial role. So this would kind of fall in to that small C change. And as we talked about, maybe over time, it in retrospect, it looks like a big C change, but maybe making smaller C changes over time. So what would this person so she's she's very tech heavy you know um very good in the weeds but she doesn't have a lot of experience leading and so whether it's within the organization or outside of it um and again it could be very specific to the person but what would you suggest if if a client like this presented themselves to you one of the first things that I would suggest that they do is that they look at the idea of leading and managing others as a skill to be acquired. And it is valid to acquire those skills in any setting possible and available to them. So there may be opportunities to serve on firm building task forces or committees or other areas related to their primary occupation, their primary employer where they can raise their level of engagement beyond the heavy technical and try out doing things differently and have a series of experiences within the construct of their current employment situation. They may say, that's too risky for me. Politically, I don't know that that's of value. Um, I don't see that those are ready opportunities. Then they need to start thinking about what else beyond the world of work that they could do where they can practice working with and through other people. And maybe it's in a volunteer capacity for their alma mater, for their community, uh, an area of interest that, that they have uniquely um, that they can add value to. And part of it is sometimes just getting started, not right. thinking so much about, I need to have X, Y, or Z absolutely clearly in place and identified as skills that I have already mastered in right. order to deploy. Sometimes you need to just get started doing a few key things where you can then say, do I want to continue to do this? Is this something that I know enough about that I feel comfortable doing more of because it provides that level of engagement and I am creating value for myself and for others by engaging in it? Right, right. And, and as we talked about um, as we we're preparing this, in this new environment um, or in general there are a lot of cross-functional committees where they can get involved um, i also have had senior people tell me more junior people or mid-level sometimes they just don't raise their hand they don't make it clear that they want these opportunities and that sometimes holds them back as well i think that's also very very real sometimes we approach change waiting for somebody to tell us to do differently and i think right. that going back to the, the title that we settled on for this webinar is leading yourself through a career change mm -hmm. a lot of it has to do with that level of ownership and sense of purpose and sense of direction and as my late mother used to say you don't get if you don't ask so sometimes raising your hand and putting yourself out there is the next right activity and action step that you can take in order to get to a different environment, to get to a different set of opportunities. Right, right, right. So um, as I expected, we're, we're pretty far along and we wanna leave time for questions. Um, so I want to talk about the branding piece. 
but I'm going to make sure to give you a, a sense of it more encapsulated because I do want, and not to rush, but I do want to make sure people have time to ask questions. I'm sure there'll be a lot of those. So here, this is kind of a summary of what Linda and I have been talking about so far, um, mostly Linda's portion of the presentation, and to think about it maybe in a different way. So having self-awareness, she's talked about that, and, and number three here, if they were numbered, volunteering, giving back, side gigs, reference that. Where can you, outside of your main role, pick up these skills, pick up this leadership experience? And then that middle piece here on the top of the slide, networking, that's one piece I really want you to be thinking about with the right people in the right places. LinkedIn is something Linda mentioned, great place to network, especially now, since we, many of us are not out of our homes too often. Um, LinkedIn, it's activity, it's having your profile ready to go. So when people come to visit you, it's your virtual home online. In a lot of cases, it's the first thing that comes up when people search for you on Google. Compare and contrast this to the wishful thinking, the unwillingness to take chances that we were just talking about or focusing on safe or easy activities. If you are at a place where you know that you're doing this, that you're holding yourself back, you're getting in your own way. This might be a good slide for you to keep in mind, maybe even put up for yourself somewhere, be thinking about how to be more in that optimization of your time, energy, and resources, living more in that space. Um, and specifically, here's the, the map I might give you defining the change, so what you're looking for in your career, using the tools at your disposal, um, we spent a lot of time talking about transportation um, when we were preparing, and Linda mentioned this already. And this slide for me, it's here's a guy with a bike. He's not really on it. And then there are other people here with bikes. Maybe they're not even in the right gear. Maybe they're in first gear. They're trying to go very fast. But they're not setting up their tools in the right way. So those, again, are analogies for you know not just having LinkedIn or having a good profile, having activity, um, churning things out, if you will. You can churn out 10 things a day on LinkedIn, but if you're not putting things that are relevant to your audience, it's really a waste of your time. You have the tools, you're using them, but you're not using them in the right way. And so that's the get in the right gear idea. And then, of course, recharting your course as your journey continues. The idea behind that phrase is those little sea changes that might add up to a big sea change, or you know, thinking organically about how do I, you know, if I move this further, much further along, or this much further along. So the teacher, um, sorry, the finance person taking on an adjunct role in teaching, for example, maybe while still looking, and I've had clients do this, while still looking for a full-time job, they take on an adjunct teaching role. Um, that might be a way to help them chart their course, and then they can decide: Do I want to go into full full-time teaching or do something in another field. The most important thing about your branding, and if you've worked with anyone on branding or heard about branding in, in a full-on um, lecture or course about branding, it's authenticity. So anything we're talking about here, building yourself out one way or another, taking on leadership, it needs to come from your core. And so that's as I define it, who you are, the value you bring in your target audience, that's the branding, but it comes from an authentic perspective. So it's not when you decide, for example, to move up into a leadership role, how should leaders act, but rather how shall I act as a leader? Building across platforms is another point that you really want to be considering when you are talking about your branding as far as leading yourself through a career change. Resume, LinkedIn profile, you know, I'm not gonna read the slide to you, you can read it. The idea is every context that you're in, including these video conferences and you know, me with my blank background, normally this is uh, a room in my home with photos and everything else, making it clearly branded for my audience without distractions. Same idea with your LinkedIn, with your resume. Don't have things 
on there or, or in your space or in your communication that are distracting from the message that you're trying to get across. That doesn't mean you can't use humor, of course, especially if that's authentic to you. It doesn't mean you can't have side conversations that, that analogize or bring you back to the main point. But you really, especially in this environment, which is very competitive right now, want to be thinking about what is it that I offer to my target audience once I've defined them or as I continue to refine what that is and how can I communicate that. So branding for change, appealing to your current audience, connecting the dots, not expecting them to figure it out, not expecting that if you've got, for example, um, the IT heavy person who's junior, a very techie LinkedIn profile, a very techie resume, very techie discussions when she talks about herself, not, and then saying, oh, I want to be a leader. Not expecting the audience to connect those dots. You need to be able to go out there and show that leadership. Own your narrative. And Linda and I talked about this extensively as well. It's, it's so unfortunate you try to pack everything into an hour. Um, can't say everything we'd like to say about this, but the idea is whether it's COVID or something else, you're not just letting the seas take you where um, they wish to take you, but rather you yourself, um, while you're going with the flow or defining your flow, if I'm not getting you seasick here, um, while you're doing that, you should be owning, I hate that word should, let me try that again, you will want to own your narrative. It behooves you to own your narrative because that is how you will get where you're going. Rather than getting on the bike and kind of turning to right or left, not knowing where you're going, if you have a plan, that's the most likely way to get there. So Linda, <laughs> um, you had some branding I, uh, I, questions for me, some ideas of clients that I might be able to help uh, give some examples on branding. Sure, sure. So I had an early career person, someone mm -hmm. who's uh, under five years post undergraduate, um, who is working in a professional services firm. And while they like their colleagues well enough, and they like the work that they're doing well enough, they are finding that that is uh, not super exciting. And they're missing a sense of what's my greater value and my greater meaning. And they are entertaining the idea of uh, transitioning out of corporate for-profit work and heading toward nonprofit work. How right. would you suggest that someone that early in their career uh, brand themselves to make that sort of a transition? Right, right. So as I always say, the branding comes from what you're actually doing and doing authentically. So, um, First thing is, if they're interested in nonprofits, they should be following your route of what is it about nonprofits that attracts them? Can they start to articulate that? And can they get into the nonprofit space to really understand if it looks like the way they expect it to, if it works for them? Um, and specifically, I'd want to know what they would want to be doing in that nonprofit. Um, but can they be building themselves out? Um, for LinkedIn, for example, Sometimes I call it a major and a minor. So you're writing your LinkedIn profile as if you are studying two things. Um, in, in the context of your career, it's really doing two things. But maybe, for example, they could be playing out, um, telling the narrative about what they're currently doing and then building in that second piece, that minor, if you will, um, building out that experience with the nonprofit space. So both doing it and showing it. Um, maybe they can volunteer with COVID. There's obviously a lot of opportunities to volunteer, whether you leave your home or not. There are a lot of leadership opportunities. Um, it could be something completely unrelated to that. It could be diversity, um, equity, inclusion. It could be um, something related to what they're currently doing, if they could offer that to a nonprofit. But the branding concept is communicating that and how that brings value to that new audience. Terrific. Thank you for that. I think the other things that I might add there is once this individual gets a clear articulation of what they're bringing from what they've been doing, mm -hmm. how are they deploying those skills in a new environment, right. in a new setting as well. Um, right. So I've got another case for you. Um, this one is a market researcher who mm -hmm. has 
um, been a, a mid mid upper mid late career professional, so ten to fifteen years post um, campus post university, and they were laid off in a reorganization several years ago. Mm. Initially, upon their layoff, um, they were able to pick up several consulting gigs within their market research specialty, um, but those seem to have not been as active. How would you uh, reposition them to seek out full-time employment given this environment? Right, right. So they were at a, a top firm or a mm -hmm. blue chip firm. Yep. And more recently, just kind of picked up pieces as they were available um, in the consulting space? Yes, yes, exactly right. Right, and so, assumedly this person would know this already, but if not, be thinking about bringing together all of that consulting experience under one umbrella certainly would be helpful. And then thinking about, we, we, we haven't touched on this as much because it's, it's um, related, but that idea of what accomplishments have they had as a consultant? What results have they been able to bring? And that's sometimes difficult. Um, maybe it's not even a result for the company or an accomplishment for the company that they're working for or organization, but what individually they were able to do. Um, obviously, again, very specific, but the idea is bringing that, bringing those different disparate elements together to tell a story so, again, they can own their narrative and really showcase that for the new employer and also not forgetting about the earlier part, bringing that all together in a, in a consistent narrative about their skills and their strengths. Excellent, excellent. I'm noting that uh, the heading on this uh, slide is the scenic route or the fastest route, and maybe yeah. we both want to touch a little bit on what that means and why we thought that was a value. Well, I see that as the big C, little c in mm -hmm. some ways, but also, um, as we said in, in COVID, you know, you're not, as we said to each other, we haven't said it here as much, you're not going to be able to necessarily get where you want to go as quickly, possibly. You may have to take a different road, a different route, but certainly you can continue to be going in that same direction. I agree, I agree. And I think that there are times where the shortest distance between two points, i.e. the fastest route, may mm -hmm. seem more expedient, but it may not also be, once you get to that destination, it may not be where you intended to be at all. Absolutely. Um, so I think those are things to bear in mind. Excellent. And you might not pick up all the skills that you wanted to have when you got there, so you may not be able to perform in that new role. 100%. So um, we have some resources. Some of these were sent to Sam um, prior. Um, some of them we added more recently, so she'll send out a fuller list after the webinar and you can certainly look us up as well. Um, you should have the slides from here. And we wanted to turn it over to Sam um, in the time remaining for questions. Perfect, thank you both for this great presentation. We do have a few questions and we wanna be respectful of everyone's time so we'll make this a lightning round Q&A. Um, so the first one that we've got here, there are so many online job search platforms, you know, mm -hmm. LinkedIn, Glassdoor, Indeed, et cetera. Um, but at a more senior level, perhaps VP and above, is it worthwhile to spend time submitting resumes via that route, or is it best to keep to recruiters and networking? And would you say that some online platforms are better than others? I would say absolutely it's worth doing. I do have clients who get jobs that way. Um, the rule we usually give for um, really everybody, but certainly um, senior people, is about 10% of that shooting into the black hole, as we call it. So um, just getting an online um, system and, I'm uh, sorry, just using an online platform as opposed to working through your network, but definitely still do it, especially if a job seems like it's a match. Um, and also you can get on recruiters, recruiters radar screens that way. Um, Linda, do you, do you have certain platforms that you think are better for executives? I do. Um, I'm most uh, uh, aligned with what LinkedIn has on offer, and I think a strategy consistent with Anne Marie's 10% responding to the this um, things that you see is to, to use LinkedIn and the tools at your disposal as a networking vehicle to identify where within your existing network or the network of the people that you have, uh, maximizing six degrees of separation. You never know who knows who 
in organizations. So when you can see an opportunity at a particular organization, but you today don't have a network into that organization, lean on LinkedIn as a way of linking the chain to find individuals who may be able to advocate for you or to advance your objectives and give you a real world point of view. I think at that VP and above level, um, there are certain recruiting firms that are known to you in a particular industry that are of good repute. Um, and definitely as you go to your network, ask. Um, ask and ye shall receive uh, the opinions of others and then evaluate them for yourselves. Um, at the more early career levels, the powerhouses, the Indeeds, the Zip Recruiters, and Monster, for example, um, those are good for more um, basic roles. But VP and above, I think the recruiters within a particular industry or within a particular set of functions, networking your way and establishing relationships with them is a likely more effective path. Great. The, the next question that we've got here, um, we've gotten a number about you know, job searching during this challenging time of COVID-19. So given that employers are potentially hunkering down due to hiring freezes, unsure of revenue, how would you recommend approaching them about potential opportunities? Um, and then maybe in the same vein, how would you recommend uh, approaching networking during this difficult time? And if we can um, keep it to just about a minute and then we'll close out here. Right. Well, I mean, that's really the, the those are the two big questions, right? Um, obviously, being mindful of people's time. Some of us have much more time. Some of us have much less time, especially those leaders who are um, having constant fire drills and putting out time. What I suggest generally to clients and would suggest even more now is that idea of shooting over um, an open request. So could we network at, I'm making it a shorter idea, but can we network at some time in the next few months is the idea. So you're not, you, you have to think about the size of your ask and in prior webinars with you, Chicago, I've talked about this size of the ask. It's not, are you available next week? It's, are you available sometime in the next few months? Um, same with thinking about jobs. Yes, there are hiring freezes. That doesn't mean you can't be getting on in front of people. It doesn't mean that you can't be getting on their lists essentially to hire when those open and they will. So you're getting in line, so to speak. You know, you're, you're at the front part of the queue rather than the back, if you will. Um, I would be thinking about it that way. Linda? I, I would also think that when you're going to the ask, you be strategic and uh, also very disciplined. So the idea that you're asking someone for help or to share what they know can't be so open-ended that they're left with having to do the preparation or anticipating what it is that you're asking about. If you can go with a strategic one to two clearly articulated questions, if you will, um, that then start them thinking so that when you actually do connect, it's a productive conversation and that you can make that connection more real and more viable. If you go too broad with your ask saying, I'm thinking about maybe making a transition in the future someday, can you help? That doesn't give them anything real to, or concrete to respond to. And so it's incumbent on you as the person seeking out information, seeking out that connection, seeking out that information, to be disciplined in your ask as well. Sam, maybe we can ask attendees to type questions into um, some kind of an evaluation and think about the idea of doing another webinar. If there's a lot, um, if there are a lot of questions and we, we think we could design something around that. That's a great idea. And actually, you will all see a survey at the end of this presentation um, that'll ask for if you have any ideas for future webinars. So that's a great place to, um, to add your questions in. And, and anyone whose questions didn't get answered, I'd be happy to pass along to Linda and Anne Marie and we can see if maybe they can reach out individually if that's okay with you too. Perfect. Um, well, thank you to everyone for participating and a special thank you to Linda and Anne Marie for sharing their actionable tips on this important topic.